Tonight's program has been brought to you by Ecological and Evolutionary Consequences of the Trophic Polymorphism in Chichlosoma Citronellum by Axel Meyer. Hello and welcome to my internet box. Today, I'm going to fill this box with a summary of a paper on chichlids and phenotypic plasticity. So. Let's start with the basics. Chichlids are a kind of fish. Biologists are interested in chichlids because there are over a thousand species that live in this one lake, Lake Malawi, in southern Africa. Lake Malawi is only about a million years old, so all of that diversity, over a thousand species, had to evolve quite recently. This is what's called an adaptive radiation. So biologists study chichlids because they can give us hints about how adaptive radiations occur. The chichlid that's the focus of this paper, Chichlosoma chitronellum, isn't from Malawi, it's from Nicaragua, but it's still a chichlid because it has that distinctive chichlid feature, the pharyngeal jaw. In humans, the part of our body that we use for engulfing, and the part of our body that we use for chewing, is the same body part, the jaw. But in chichlids, it's different. They have one jaw on the outside for engulfing and another jaw on the inside, close to the pharynx, for chewing. That's why it's called a pharyngeal jaw. The paper states that the pharyngeal jaw frees the oral jaws to become specialized for particular feeding tasks, allowing for increased independent morphological specialization in both elements. This is a fairly common pattern that we see in evolution. When there's only one version of a body part, natural selection usually acts as a conservative force, maintaining the form and function of that organ. But when the body part gets duplicated, the natural selection maintaining the structure of the organ can be relaxed, allowing for new functions to evolve while the old one is maintained in the other duplications. So, one hypothesis that this paper tries to address is whether the presence of the pharyngeal jaw in chichlids is responsible for their adaptive radiation. This idea is made more complicated by the fact that this single species of chichlid actually has two kinds of pharyngeal jaws. Some members of the species have papilliform jaws with tiny pointy teeth perfect for chewing up soft-bodied prey, and other members of the species have malariform jaws with round, large teeth perfect for cracking the tough shells of snails. The author of the paper, Axel Meyer, examined about 600 Chichlosoma citronellum jaws and produced this graph. The population is clearly divided into two groups based on teeth size. Fish either have large teeth or small teeth. Very few fish have intermediate sized teeth. But having a malariform jaw doesn't just change the size of the teeth. The jaw affects the entire cranial structure of the fish, making the head thicker and wider. It also changes the color of the fish. Papilliform fish are usually more gold, while malariform fish are usually darker colored. But here's the crazy thing. All the fish in this species start out with a papilliform jaw. You can see in this graph that the smallest chichlids are all papilliform. It's only after the fish grow a bit that their morphologies diverge, some becoming large-toothed, others remaining small-toothed. So, what causes a malariform jaw to develop? Diet. Distribution of the malariform morph in Nicaragua correlates well with the distribution of snails, so it seems like these fish develop larger teeth only when they're in an environment where they can use them. Meyer describes how he raised the fish on either a hard or a soft diet and watched their morphologies diverging. In one experiment, Meyer actually changed the diet of malariform fish to a softer diet, and some of the fish actually reverted back to a papilliform jaw. We typically assume that massive phenotypic differences like this need to have genetic differences underneath to produce them. But when Meyer did a mitochondrial DNA analysis of the two kinds of fish, he found no significant genetic differences between the two morphologies. But just because genetic differences aren't there doesn't mean that evolution isn't happening. Meyer notes that whatever the color of the fish was, it tended to choose that same color of fish to mate with. Preferential breeding like this could be the first step towards speciation. It appears that in C. citronellum, because color and jaw morph are associated, we may find a synergistic effect of ecological differentiation and sexual selection. Polymorphisms may be speeding up speciation events and be intermediate steps during the formation of new 
taxa. For this scenario, it does not matter whether the phenotypic polymorphism is entirely genetically determined. This is a huge claim, so let's take a step back. Meyer is careful to note that this study is just on plasticity and jaw morphologies. He didn't collect data on speciation, so we can't make strong claims about it. But still, the point is important nonetheless. What this paper shows is that these fish are adapting their bodies and their mating habits to different ecological niches before any genetic evolution takes place. This is why plasticity is so important. Organisms can adapt their bodies to their current environment without any genetic change. If speciation does occur, that is, if genetic change follows this phenotypic change, it will only be because plasticity led the way. The central dogma of biology claims that the genotype causes the phenotype, not the other way around. But plasticity makes this more complex. In biology, causes and effects aren't linear, they're circular. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to see more like it, you can click the subscribe button.